Hey everyone, TGIT, it is Thursday and I'm super excited to be here. So hopefully you guys will get this notification and we can uh, get some people on and we can get going. So is anybody there yet? Well, I hopefully we'll have some people hop on and we will get going. Super excited to be here. All right, let me make sure we have everything good. All right, guys, who's there? It's Thursday night, and we are going to answer your cancer questions going tonight, and then hopefully get out of here. All right, see some people. Hey there, everyone. How are we doing? Let's see. Anyone there? Let's see. I'm hopefully doing this right. Um, we are trying a new thing tonight. And hopefully this is... Checking in now. All right, so hopefully we'll have some people hop on and we can start filling in. Um, I want to announce, make a few announcements today. Um, and okay, so Caitlin is here, yay. So Caitlin's always here to help me um, with any of the technical difficulties. If anybody else is on, so sorry guys, a little bit of a rough start. I had to still figuring out some new software, but I'm super excited. So it looks like we have some people jumping on. I would love for people to tell me who's here and where are you from. Um, and we will get going because I know everybody is busy and tired after a busy day in clinics. And so uh, hopefully we will make this short and brief. Hey, Kyle, how are you? Um, so Kyle, if anyone um, knows her or doesn't know her yet, Dr. Kyle Stevenson, she is up in Watertown, which is way, way, way north on the top of New York. Um, I know I was complaining about the cold that we had here last week. And uh, Kyle, what was it with you? Like minus 31 with or without the... Um, the um, wind chill. So it's been super cold, but we had a nice warm day in New York and I can't believe I think 45 is warm. Is anybody else here? Definitely uh, let me know who's here and um, if you guys have any questions. I have a couple of questions that were posted um, in the comments um, on the different posts that we did for this. So I'm hoping that those two will hop on, but if not, we can definitely answer their questions. And um, and get them um, going. Hmm, so um, just making sure this is working. Like I said, I'm trying some new software and, oh, it was only minus 24. Kyle, I do not even know how cold that is. Um, so I think I was once in Killington when it was minus 10. I think after it's that cold, you just don't know. So if anybody else is on, I'd love to know. Emily is here in South Dakota. It was minus 20. Hey, Bill, how are you? Uh, so it's great to see you all. Um, Emily, you are one of the ones that I have your question um, noted. So I know you had some questions about mast cell tumors, so we will get going with that. I'm super excited that you guys are joining me. So what are we doing? What are these office hours? So I was trying to think of an easy way to have conversations about cancer and easy ways for you guys to reach me. Um, I do get some emails um, often after I'm speaking or just sort of that trickle in throughout the year. And I'll be honest, I'm not always good at getting back to email. Uh, first confession is I do not type well. So emails take me a long time. And so I'm always trying to pin them to the top of my email box. Box, and I just thought that this would be a better way to, for me to easily answer your guys' questions. Another great way if you guys have questions in between office hours, so you can obviously now we're going to try to do these monthly, so you can save them up. Hey, Jenny, welcome. Yay, thanks for joining me. Uh, Jenny is an awesome um, specialty oncology technician uh, based out of Louisiana, So, and one of my conference traveling um, buddies. So... Um, 
So a couple ways to get some questions answered. So I'm going to try to do these office hours if you guys like them monthly. Um, these are to answer your guys' questions, talk about cancer, just whatever's on your mind. Because um, like I was just saying, for me, email's just not the easier way. The other thing is to post questions in this group. This is the whole point of the group is that not just, you know, is to have a whole community of support and answering your questions and different points of view and see what people, what their challenges are with cancer cases. Um, and I'll be honest, I'm more likely to get in the group and answer your questions sooner than email. Don't ask me why, it's just sort of I will. So um, my email box is always just, um, you know, over 100 unanswered emails. So, um, True confessions here. So, okay, so if you have questions for me, we're gonna try to do these office hours. The next one, I think, and Caitlin, correct me if I'm wrong, I know we have one on Thursday, March 1st. Um, Thursdays tend to work better for me. Do Thursdays work for you guys? Will that be okay? Um, we could try another night of the week, and then I was trying to do them later because I figured, you know, we talked about doing them during the day, but I was worried that that wouldn't work because it's so hard in the middle of the day. So if anybody has thoughts or comments, do you guys like the evening? Do you think there's a better day of the week? Throw that in the comments as well, because that's something, you know, that we can try another, um, uh, we can try another one a different time. So Caitlin is helping me remind you guys that the next one is Thursday, March 1st at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, again, we are trying to give everybody time after clinics to get home. Um, if I did it at 10, which would probably be better for the West Coast, I would be falling asleep. Um, and then the other cool thing that we have planned that I'm starting in 2018 are pet owner Q&As. Again, these will be live events. We're doing some in the evening and then we'll try a few in the afternoon as well. I did a few last month and they were great. So if you have clients that have you know questions and wanna ask some questions and also just meet other supportive pet owners, they can join those Q&As and I'm more than happy for any of you to come. The first one is Wednesday, January 24th, 6.30 Eastern. Um, and that's going to be, we're doing them themed. So that's going to be canine lymphoma. Then in February, um, and hopefully Caitlin can help me get the dates up there. February, um, we're doing cat lymphoma. And then we have an afternoon one, I think in March, and we're going to decide on the topic. So again, great opportunities for your clients if they have questions to join in. So that's it. Um, and then oh, we also have Thursday, April 19th is also on the book for the group. So that's again for you guys. So do you guys like this? Is this something that you think will hopefully be helpful? Um, definitely give me a shout out. Say, yeah, we're here. We're listening. Um, one of the ideas that Caitlin and I talked about was making these sort of happy hour-ish. So if you wanted to bring a certain beverage, you could. I am actually drinking tea tonight because my throat's a little sore. Um, but... Um, you know, we can all, we can make it a happy hour. I think, you know, wine and cheese would be great. Um, the other thing is uh, in your comment section right now is a link to the events on the Dr. Sue page, and that will give you all of the Q and A's for pet owners. And it's a great way to share those with your clients, even on your, uh, your, your veterinary page, uh, your personal hospital pages, if you can access that and just give more value to our clients in another way. Hey, Brandy. So I do see that Brandy and Emily are here and they are the two that both asked questions ahead of time in some of the comments. So, um, do you guys want to hear one of their questions on, um, mast cell tumors or do you guys want to throw a few questions in the comments with what's on your mind? Anyone? Anyone want to give me a thumbs up that you're still here, still listening? Um, this is the hard part with these things is sometimes I feel like I'm talking to my children and no one's listening. So hopefully you guys are listening. And uh, again, I'm super excited for you to be here. Yay, I got a thumbs up. Woohoo! Okay, so um, I'm going to go with, I think either one of these questions will be um, really um, helpful for the group. So the first one is from Brandy um, Davis Bailiff, who's here. Um, and thank you for joining us. So she asked a question about, I'm assuming a dog with a grade three mast cell tumor or a high grade mast cell tumor. And her question was, um, when do we use Palladia? When do we use Vinblastine? And what questions do we have about the mast cell tumor panel? When do I use that? Um, and then if you have cost concerns, because mast cell tumor panel is super expensive, um, what do I do in those cases? And then uh, two other questions were, when do we start chemo after surgery? And when, what are Palladia side effects? So super great questions. Um, we could probably spend the whole time, but I'm going to try to, you know, um, answer as many parts of that as possible. So 
what the, one of the easy parts of that question is in general after surgery, and this is really for any tumor across the board, I recommend removing, removing. I remember, I'm done, too tired. I recommend starting chemotherapy at suture removal. So about 10 to 14 days after the surgery. So usually, you know, when everything is nice and healed, if that dog comes in 10 to 14 days after surgery, and we're going to, you know, planning on taking out the sutures or the stable, the stable, I can't speak, or the staples, and then it looks inflamed or there's a lot of it, maybe infection inflammation on there, I'm going to wait a week to start chemotherapy. So you want your incision to be nice and healed. And again, some of the mast cell tumors can take a little bit longer to heal postoperatively. So that would definitely be a reason to delay. But in general, two weeks after surgery is going to be a great time for the dog to come in, check the incision, and start with chemotherapy. So you got back your biopsy, and it says that you have a high-grade, grade 3 mast cell tumor. I'm going to give you a couple other tips that I think about when I look at that biopsy report is one of the things you want to look at, and it should be on all of our biopsy reports, our plain Jane biopsy reports is the mitotic index. Brandy, do you know offhand what the mitotic index was for your dog? And also if your dog has a name and you remember it, I would love that as well. Um, the reason I'm asking about mitotic index, so mitotic index is a reflection of how aggressive the cancer is, but basically it's how many cancer cells were in the process of dividing and in the state of mitoses when they're looking at the biopsy. And there's some really good studies that show that dogs that have a higher mitotic index, usually somewhere between five and seven per 10 high power fields, do significantly worse than dogs that are below that cutoff. And if you look at a study that was done by a great colleague of mine, Dr. Aaron Romanzik, his residency study showed that dogs that were above, and this is regardless of grade, dogs that were above that mitotic index, their survival time was three to four months, and dogs that were below the mitotic index, again, regardless of grade, had a median survival time of 30 months. So that is, you know, really good information um, just in terms of prognosis. I do like to do the mast cell tumor panel. But it's expensive, and that gives us some of these proliferation markers, which again are just different ways to measure how rapidly these cancer cells are dividing. And why is that important? Because studies have shown that dogs with higher proliferation markers more likely to have metastasis and shorter survival times, and we're going to recommend chemo. This dog, usually dogs with high-grade grade 3 mast cell tumors, I'm going to be recommending chemo anyway. So I might not do the full mast cell tumor panel, Brandy. Why? Because it's expensive, and I already know that this dog needs chemo. I'm using the CKIT mutation part of that mast cell tumor panel so I can figure out which chemo I would use, specifically Palladia in my protocol or not. So does that make sense so far? So you have your panel, you know, or you have your biopsy, you know that you have a dog with a high-grade mast cell tumor, you can just recommend doing the CKIT mutation part, in my humble opinion. If, for let's play devil's advocate, you have a dog with a low grade, grade one, grade two, low mitotic index, no evidence of metastasis on lymph node aspirate and um, ultrasound and things like that, I'm going to do the full mast cell tumor panel because I want as much information that's going to help me go to those owners and say, I think your dog with this intermediate grade, cleanly resected mast cell tumor has a greater likelihood of metastasis and we should do chemo or not. So for your dog, Brandy, I would just probably do the CKIP mutation. Um, and again, you can just do that part of the panel. Um, and I do mine at Michigan State, and they definitely let you do that part. So that should answer your question, the part with the money concerns. Um, Brandy, hopefully that is helping. If it is, give me a thumbs up or put a comment in the comment section. Um, and if anybody else has any questions as we're going through that, definitely you know, put them in the comments because I want to try to make this as interactive as possible and answer your guys' questions, um, yay, um, for you and not get too far ahead and then have you guys forget the question. So if you have anything, just throw them in the comments. I'm glancing over that as I'm talking about it. So um, then let's, let's do the two scenarios. So you get back that the dog is CKIT mutation positive. So that is that genetic mutation about a third of dogs with mast cell tumors have, and it makes their tumors more aggressive. And we now have Palladia, which is a CKIT inhibitor. So it targets that mutation. And we, do, we know that dogs that have the mutation 
have um, had a 70% response rate as opposed to the dogs without the mutation only had a 40% response rate. So it can still work in dogs without the mutation. If you absolutely can't run it, you still could use it, but again, only about a third of dogs have the mutation. So statistically, they, you know, if you're an odds betting person, they probably don't. But again, you don't know until you run it. So if the dog doesn't have the mutation, um, I would use vimblastine and then once I got that panel back, I will start doing a protocol where I alternate vimblastine, two doses of vimblastine every two weeks apart, and then I give a dose of lomustine orally and then I go back and forth. In general, the multi-agent protocols are better than single agent protocols, so that's why I like to do that. If the dog is CKIT mutation positive, even if I knew that on the day the dog came to see me for chemo, I would not start Palladia that day. Why? Because Palladia in the original studies didn't, in general, had a very, I think it was like 10 or 15% had a complete response. So in general, it's going to be better to, again, do a multi-Asian approach. So that, I'm going to start with my vimblastine, and then I usually will do two months of vimblastine, and then I'm going to switch them over to Palladia if they have the mutation. That's typically my algorithm or how I break them down. So again, I like vimblastine usually with prednisone in the beginning for the first month or two. And then if they have um, the mutation, I'm going to get them onto a Palladia protocol for at least four to six months. And then if they don't have the mutation, I'm going to do my six-month protocol and I'm going to be alternating um, two vimblastines and then a lomustine. There's a few other protocols out there. You can use cyclophosphamide vimblastine, and PRED is another protocol that I would use or consider using for the CKIT mutation negative dogs. Um, but again, that is where I tell the owners, you know, listen, we don't need the whole panel on your dog that needs chemo. Let's pick the test that's going to be practical and prognostic. So it's going to tell me, you know, about the dog's prognosis and be practical. It's going to allow me to make good treatment decisions for that dog. Um, is that good so far? Still there, Brandy? Um, hopefully you are. Throw a comment in the comment section. Anybody have any questions on what I asked about or what I spoke about so far with mast cell tumors? Yay, we got a thumb. That's good. That means that somebody's still with me. Um, if not, the other part of Brandy's question are Palladia side effects. And that is a really great question because... Um, Palladia is a little bit different. So, and I like to talk about, you know, in general, if we're giving lomustine, doxorubicin, vimblastine, any of the traditional chemotherapy drugs, like the CHOP chemotherapy protocol, in general, most of the time, you're going to see side effects within that first week of chemo. So GI side effects, vomiting, inapidins, anorexia, diarrhea, which are usually mild, occur, you know, usually one to five days after chemo and usually last two to three days. And most of the naders, the low neutrophil counts are going to be occurring usually, um, you know, seven days after chemo, but some, you know, have a later nader, um, which is different than palladia. Palladia neutropenia tends not to be a huge deal. I have seen it in some dogs with chronic usage, and we can lower the dose. Um, you never want to lower the dose below 2.2 mg per kg. That's thought to be the lowest effic efficacious dose. Um, but... Um, with Palladia, you tend not to see side effects within the first week. I have seen some dogs get a little bit nauseous and anorexic the first week, but in general, it's going to be over the first, I tell owners, like, you know, four to six to eight weeks, and we're looking for weight loss. We're looking for changes in appetite, and they can be really subtle, and sometimes the only thing that you'll notice is that they're losing weight because owners are, you know, and you guys know this, right? Owners have such a hard time identifying poor appetite and inappetence. Um, and, you know, if they come in and they tell you, oh, they're only eating chicken, that means they're inappetent. They're like, no, but they're eating chicken, great. That means that dog's appetite's not normal. And so that might be a dog that I would add Serenia on Palladia days about an hour before. So um, in general with Palladia, you're not going to see side effects, you know, within the first week, though some dogs will. I've had some dogs get really bad diarrhea the first week. Um, but you do um, want to monitor them closely. The way that I do Palladia when I start it, I have them come back in two weeks, check their weight, check a CBC. Have them come back in two more weeks, check their CBC, check a chemistry panel. If they're doing super fantastic, I have them stay at that dose and come back in a month. 
if they're still not doing great and you're lowering the dose, I'm never going to lower the dose and say come back in a month. I'm going to have them come back in two more weeks, check their weight, find out how they're doing, see if I need to add Serenia or an appetite stimulant or something like that. Um, but usually I tell owners, give me those first four to six weeks and usually the dose that you are at at that point will be their chronic dose and they can tolerate it really well. I will still see them back at least every um, four weeks to start, and then once they're really, really stable, if they need it chronically, sometimes I'll go um, to uh, every six-week appointments. Um, but they can get, you know, delayed neutropenias. They can get liver value elevations. They can rarely get protein-losing nephropathies. So I personally recommend getting a baseline urine protein-creatinine ratio. So sort of a lot. Um, hopefully that was helpful. Um, but again, you know, a pretty good... Um, Great question about, you know, high-grade mast cell tumors and when to use palladia and when, then not. So, Brandy, hopefully um, answer yes or no if I got all of your questions uh, in there. I tried to jot them all down. Um, and then we'll go on to Emily. Hopefully, Emily, are you still here? Um, if you are, put a comment in the comment. Um, I'm going to put a comment just to make sure my thing's still going there. Um, so, um, there we go. So, Emily, are you still here? Yay, Emily. Okay, so Emily had a dog so uh, with a mast cell tumor that was incompletely removed. So going back to um, Brandy's case, you know, when we said tips for you to look at on your biopsy, this goes back to that. And I can't emphasize this enough. This is like one of my huge pet peeves at biopsy reports. And are there any pathologists on? Because I might upset somebody. So sometimes they're going to write clean you know, clean margins um, on it. But then you look at the description and it says one millimeter margin on the lateral margin, you know, in that, or I've seen some in microns now. So that's not clean, you know, and really for mast cell tumors, we're looking for one to two centimeter margins. There are some studies that show the lower grade ones don't need quite as big margins. Um, but again, you want to look at it. So, but for Emily's case, we have a dog with a mast cell tumor with incomplete margins. Emily, one of my questions for you is, do we know the grade of the tumor? Um, I'm assuming high, but I don't know that. Um, and her question is, the dog has been on six, on prednisone for six months and also got three doses of low mustine chemotherapy. And her question was, um, how long to keep the dog on prednisone? So Emily, if you remember the grade, you can put that in the comment, that would be great. So the reason that I'm asking is, in general, we think about using chemotherapy for dogs that either have metastasis. So today I just saw a dog with a low-grade mast cell tumor that metastasized to the inguinal lymph node. So that's a dog I'm going to put on chemo. Um, it was a little bit weird that the biopsy said low-grade had a very low mitotic index. And so that is probably a good example of that these cases can be really challenging and that I can tell you, you know, a low mitotic index shouldn't metastasize, but sometimes they do. So, you know, this is a tumor where I always, always say one size does not fit all. So Emily's saying um, that Iowa only um, grades on the two grade system and it was high grade. Great. And yay, Brandy, I'm glad that that helped you. So... That's interesting that Iowa has decided only to do it because the there's a veterinary oncology pathology group and their recommendation was that pathologists use both grading systems. It is what it is. So the traditional Patnik 1, 2, 3, um, and then the uh, Maddie Copel out of Michigan State, low, high. So hers was read out as a high grade, um, and she doesn't remember the mitotic index. And Emily, that's totally fine. I can barely remember what I had for breakfast, so... Um, no worries. But again, that might be a good thing to go back and look at for your dog. Just, you know, another piece of prognostic information. And it's free. It should be on your biopsy report. And guys, if your pathologist did not include your mitotic index on your biopsy report, go back, email them, leave them a voicemail message and ask them to give that to you because, you know, sometimes they just need a little bit of a nudge. So just remind them you really want that information. Um, so Emily, it was a high grade um, in general, you know, chemotherapy, I think about more to prevent metastasis, um, delay or d delay or prevent it, or if it has metastasis or maybe in the gross disease setting, like a non-surgical case. Um, in general, we don't think about chemo to prevent recurrence, but it, so that was one of my questions. So, uh, it's great that the, uh, assuming that the dog has been on it for six months, you know, 
um, and got three doses of chemo that there's no recurrence. I would, I'll be honest, I personally do my prednisone shorter. I usually do it over um, in the microscopic disease setting with chemo. I probably would have gotten the dog off pred in like after two months and I probably would have done more low mustine. That would have been my present, my preference. And then I usually do six months of therapy and then I take them off. Obviously with pred, you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to taper the dog off that and I would do an ultrasound. If money is not an issue, I would do an ultrasound with the dog on therapy and make sure there's no metastasis. Then I usually taper them off and then I have them come back um, maybe in another four to six weeks and do another ultrasound because you want to make sure, especially in a dog with high grade, that there's no metastasis. And depending on where it is, if you can aspirate the draining lymph node, that would be really helpful as well. But I think that six months of therapy is a good amount of therapy, especially if you're treating now in the micro microscopic disease setting. So you have no gross disease at the scar and you have no evidence of internal metastasis with liver spleen being the most common place. And just remember, if your liver and spleen look abnormal, you should do ultrasound guided aspirates of your liver and spleen. We seem to go back and forth as to whether or not you should be aspirating normal liver and spleens. There are some studies show that ultrasounds can be false negative, right? Meaning they could look normal on ultrasound and still have metastasis. So after that study came out, I was doing ultrasound guided aspirates on everybody if they had the finances. Um, and now I've sort of swung back and if the internist who does my ultrasounds think that the liver and spleen look abnormal, either one of those or both, then we'll do our aspirates because it does add to the cost and you have to sedate them and it's a little bit more risky. Um, so Emily, I think it would be a great time to get the dog off therapy and definitely ultrasound. And then once they're off therapy and if they're in remission, uh, especially for a high grade mast cell tumor, I would ultrasound them every two months, every three months at max for the first year. And then you can start thinking about spacing them out. Um, Emily, any other questions on your mast cell tumor that I didn't get to? And again, go back um, and look at the mitotic index. That's really interesting. Um, and just on the flip side, I told you today, I just saw a dog, Lexi, who had a low grade one with a low mitotic index that metastasized. My parents' dog had one that was like, I told you that five to seven was a cutoff and theirs was like over 20. Um, the dog had a lot of other health issues um, and um, they didn't treat and, and she lived 10 months. So again, just because, you know, median survival times three to four months doesn't mean that there's not, you know, worth treating or things like that. So sometimes our statistics are not right. And I always tell owners, I hope that I'm wrong and that your dog is beating the statistics and living longer than we expect. Um, Emily says, thank you. That covers it. Really appreciate it. Awesome. So uh, Kyle had another question. Since those rare uh, instances, do you re recommend the prognostic panel for the low grade, low mitotics? Yeah. So if that's a great question, Kyle. So her question is, do I recommend the full panel? So if I, I for a dog that has a low grade, low mitotic index completely removed, I absolutely do. Um, and I use that information to give me the comfort that we can just monitor the dog or do we need to add chemo? So I'll always do the staging ultrasound, right? I'll always try to aspirate the draining lymph nodes, but assuming everything is negative for metastasis, for those low grade, low mitotic index mast cell tumors, I do the full panel. And I tell the owners like, this is really valuable information. I know this is an expensive test, but this is gonna really help me to predict your dog's outcome. And if they have high scores, so the key 67 um, and the Agnor, and then those scores, if those are high, even if they're CKIT negative, I'm probably gonna recommend chemo. If they're CKIT mutation positive, I'm gonna recommend chemo. The hard ones is sometimes you have a dog where some scores are high and some are low. And then I just talk it over with the owners and we just try to you know, figure out are they proactive people and they wanna give chemo or they're more conservative and we're just gonna go monitoring. So again, you know, um, and I'll be honest, that dog Lexi today, because she was a weird case, because it was low grade, low mitotic index with metastasis, even though I'm giving her chemo, we did the full panel. Just because everything just doesn't jive in her, it doesn't match up. But if she was a financial concern case, I would just have run the CKIP mutation part of it. Um, Beth, hey, how are you? Um, how do I feel about interlesional chemo for incompletely resected mast cell tumors like 5-FU or the Imucidin? I'll be honest, I'm ambivalent. So um, I, some of my colleagues, um, 
two of them in New Mexico talked about using 5-FU, which I just have to, I laughed. So the other cancer that we use 5-FU for um, intravenously is dogs with mammary tumors. And there's always a chuckle from my team when I say, yo, 5-FU today. Um, so it's 5 fluorocell um, and you can use it intralesionally. I don't have a lot of experience using it and you're still giving chemo and you have to be with all the safety concerns and stuff like that. But there are some studies that show good responses. Back in my Animal Medical Center residency days, I'll date myself, um, we also used to use triamcinolone, and you can inject that into it. So that's another way if you have a huge mast cell tumor. And I believe that there was just a paper either in JAVMA or Veterinary Comparative Oncology, um, I want to say out of Tufts possibly, talking about using injectable steroids into the tumors as well. Um, it's on my pile of list of things to read, but I don't remember the response rate. So, um, I think that those are good alternative options for non-resectable mast cell tumors. But, you know, if you have one where you can cut it out, you know, that is going to be the best thing for these dogs. Um, because, you know, a lot of mast cell tumors with surgery alone can essentially be cured. Those low grade, low mitotic index ones with low proliferation scores. So, um, I'm not against it. Um, definitely with a 5-FU, be careful with chemotherapy safety aspects of it. I don't do it, um, so I can't give you a lot of personal tips from it, but I do think it's a good option. I also have had some dogs with non-resectable mast cell tumors, like over the hock. Uh, actually, one of the employees, one of the nurses at um, my previous hospital had one. We gave some injectable vimblastine and steroids, and the tumor shrunk really nicely. Surgeon was then able to go in and get margins. One thing to think about, if you're going to do anything before you remove that, just remember if you're going to stick chemo or steroids in there, you need to get your biopsy, right? You should probably do some sort of punch biopsy because you're not going to get the grade once you start messing up that chemo. So in that case, we got a punch biopsy of the mast cell tumor. So I knew what the grade was. We knew that it was C kit mutation negative. Then we gave our, our injectable chemo and steroids. The tumor shrunk. Dog went to chemotherapy, and that's how we approach that case. So, again, just remember, you know, it's just like giving prednisone to a lymphoma case before you get all your diagnostics. It's going to mess up your diagnostics. So just think about that if you have one of those cases that you're going to give chemo or something, either, you know, intralesional or intravenous or oral, it could change your biopsy results and make it look less aggressive or just met, or make a lot of necrosis, and then you're not going to be able to, you know, get good diagnostics that we want. And the mast cell tumor panel is not one you want to waste money on. Um, any, does that help, Beth, hopefully? Um, are you, I'm just curious if you want to throw in the comments, are you at a place where they do that? Is that some something that um, you've had the specialist in your area doing? Or is that something you're doing in your practice? So um, like I said, for non-resectable mast cell tumors could definitely be a good option. I'm glad that was helpful. So, um, we are at about the half hour mark. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I am not working tomorrow, woo -woo, uh, but I'm heading down to the VBMA meeting in Orlando. Um, I actually was super excited because last week when it was um, in the single digits here, it was 80. Um, Caitlin's going as well, but I just noticed that it's going to be 60 on Saturday and it's going to be uh, 58 tomorrow when I leave. So. Yo, no. Hey, Rita's here. So Rita is, um, just got back. So I missed my holiday party. So we had our post holiday holiday party, um, tonight at work and I had already scheduled this, so I didn't go, but Rita is our third year medical oncology residency. And she just snuck in other, under the wire because I told her I was going to give her crap if she didn't show up. Rita, was the party fun? I hope so. Hope you, uh, there was like laser tag and stuff like that. So if you guys have any other questions, um, I'll, you know, be on for another minute or two. I so appreciate you guys hopping on. I would really, really like to know, like, if you guys think this is helpful, I will get on about once a month and do this. If you guys don't think this is that helpful, you know, we do, I don't need to do this. So I, you know, I want to do it for you guys because I, I need an easier way to answer questions. So I'm happy to do that. If you like this, throw a yes in the comments. If you want more of these, that's great if you think monthly will be great. So throw in the comments, um, how often do you think monthly is good? Um, good, thank you, Lynn. 
Um, thank you, Shannon. That's what I, it's hard when you're on this side. I'm like, is anyone there? Um, hey, Jim, how are you? Oh, yes, definitely. There was, um, and Bruce is here. Good, good, good. I see now I feel like there's a little bit of love here. I felt all alone. Um, so um, Jim is monthly would be nice. And I'm going to probably do 9 p.m. unless you guys tell me otherwise, because I feel like doing it in the middle of the clinic day sucks for me. Um, but I also, I could, there is a day of the week where I'm sometimes off. So if you guys like evening, um, we'll probably stick with evening. Um, so Jim, secondary agents for lymphoma when escaping after tenovia. So, um, I'll, so the gym um, had a question about you what to use after Tenovia. So um, how are you, Jim? Good, good. Um, so my question for you, oh, oh yes, and then there was a question um, about a digits games. So great, great, great. Okay, evening is better. I agree, Kim, but again, um, hey, Lisa, how are you? Um, I just want to make sure that this is as useful as possible. And obviously, if you can't come, this will be in the group and you'll be able to catalog it and will probably be on my YouTube channel at some point. Oh, I want to tell you guys this before I answer the last couple of questions. So I'm trying to build up a good you know, information for you guys, a good catalog of information for you and clients. So I'm working on my YouTube channel a lot this year. Um, and so we're going to have these Q and A's. I also, when I go to conferences, I have the opportunity to sit down with some amazing people and I'm trying to do, you know, like 15, 10, 15 minute interviews. So I've done one with Mary Gardner that's on the YouTube channel with Dr. Caitlin DeWile with Caitlin. Um, Dave Nichols should be coming. I I have to get that one edited, but that'll be coming out soon. So that'll be other useful information. So not just a cancer perspective, but other things going on. So um, I love to be able to um, share those with them. And I, I'm lucky because I have a lot of fun hanging out with those people. So um, that'll be, and then the other thing that I'm doing is my vlog. So I'm up to vlog number 22, really trying, and this would be great if you could share with your clients. And if you guys could please subscribe to my channel or share it, um, you know, it really shows, I'm trying to demystify the process of your of pet getting cancer and what happens when they're getting chemo and going behind closed doors. So um, I've spent a lot of time trying to build up that and I want us to be able to share it. So again, if you guys want to check out the vlogs, that would be awesome. Brandy likes once a month. Good, good, good. All right. So Jim, if you could throw in the comment section. So did you use Tenovia as your frontline agent or did you use another protocol and then go to Tenovia? Um, so while he's putting that in the comments, does everybody know about Tenovia? Um, this is that relatively new um, chemotherapy drug that was developed for dogs with cancer, specifically with lymphoma is what it's labeled for. Um, it is, um, sorry, it is by Vet DC, is a relatively new company in the veterinary oncology sphere. And it, one of the things that's really, really nice about it is they have a lot of clinical studies going on at the universities, as opposed to some of the other newer lymphoma therapies that were shown to be safe, but didn't really have the efficacy studies. So one of the things that I really love about Tenovia is the amount of studies that they're doing and they're continuing to do. So um, Tenovia is labeled for dogs with lymphoma. It is conditionally licensed, and I know us oncologists harp on that, but it's really what we need to be careful about conditionally licensed is you can't use it off-label um, until it's fully licensed. Palladia was conditionally licensed for about five years, and then they you know, did more studies, and they were able to get it fully licensed. Um, Kynovet, do you guys remember Kynovet for mast cell tumors um, by AB Science? That did not go from conditional to fully licensed, so you can't use it off-label. Luckily, it has a pretty generous label, meaning you can use it for new, newly diagnosed lymphoma cases, and you can use it for relapse cases. You can use it with concurrent medications, whether that's steroids, you can use it with, um, you know, Serenia and your other typical medications. Um, it is labeled for to give five doses in the initial protocol, and that's it, every three weeks apart at a MIG per kg. And there's a lot of great information on their website as well. And it'll be in my lymphoma talk. So if you're at any of the conferences that I am, I have a nice little section on there. So as a single agent in newly diagnosed patients, we're seeing about, I want to say about a 75% overall response rate. So that includes your complete remission, your partial responses, and your stable disease 
not your progressive disease. So it's sort of in the category of single agent doxorubicin and to be honest, more expensive. So, um, you know, I don't think it's going to replace the CHOP chemotherapy protocol. If you want higher remission rates, I would still pick a University of Wisconsin CHOP. Uh, multi-agent protocol, but it's a good second, you know, a good option if an owner can't afford or doesn't like the scheduling, you know, the weekly scheduling of a CHOP chemotherapy protocol. So you could do single agent Tenovia every three weeks. Contraindicated against label to use in Westies can cause pulmonary fibrosis and they're a breed that can get pulmonary fibrosis. And I talk about this in my lectures. What was the first dog that I wanted to give it to was a Westie. So again, it's not, um, it would be against label to use that. So Jim, my question is, if I used it as a first line therapy and the dog failed it, then I would probably go to lay and the owners didn't want to do a multi-agent protocol. I'd probably go to doxorubicin um, and maybe try that, assuming it's B-cell. If it was a T-cell lymphoma, I would probably go lomustine as my single agent uh, drug. Um, there is also a really good study that just came out in June by Doug Pham, who did a lot of the Tenovia research, where instead of doing single agent, they gave alternating doxorubicin and Tenovia. I don't remember in the study which one they started with. And there was like an 86% overall response rate. So that's really cool because that might be better than just single agent Tenovia. So again, it goes back to sort of the mantra with lymphoma that in general, a multi-agent protocol is going to be better than a single agent protocol. But again, you want to cap out at five in your original protocol um, because that's what it's labeled as. So if your dog had CHOP, and then and maybe maxed out on its doxorubicins and then got tenovia and then failed that or maxed out on that and still needed chemo other good rescue protocols that i like you could do lomustine orally is a good one i really really like the mop protocol but that is using mustergen so you really want to make sure that you have great chemotherapy safety precautions um, with that um, because that's the same stuff that mustergen gas is made for so you want to have your hood and your closed system and your masks and all that other good stuff um, so um, but i'm just scrolling down um, just to see if you said what the Jim, did the, did the dog see other chemotherapy before Tenovia? Um, but again, that would be sort of my hierarchy. You know, if the dog has not seen CHOP and the owners are ready to do that, maybe you could go to CHOP. Um, but again, depending if it's B versus T, a single agent doxorubicin, single agent lomustine. I really, really love the MOP uh, protocol. Um, so it was the first line. So yeah, and if you knew it was B cell, and the owner still didn't want to do a CHOP chemotherapy protocol, I would probably go to single agent doxorubicin. No, you know, as long as the heart is okay, doesn't have any, you know, arrhythmias or anything like that. Um, and again, with doxorubicin, we usually max out at six. Lomustine would be another good option. If I knew it was T cell and it failed to Novia, I would go to um, Lomustine. The other cool thing that's, I mean, I think, I honestly think we're going to start to see Tenovia in a, in a multi-agent protocol. There are studies using it in cats. There are studies using it um, in multiple myeloma and things like that. So again, we can't do it yet because it's, it would be, it's conditionally licensed. It would be against the label. But I think there's a lot of great studies going on, and we're going to actually start to see um, some more uses for it. Um, Tenovia, in my experience, and the clinicians who did a lot of the studies before me, um, we do see a little bit more profound anorexia. Um, so in addition to automatically having the owners do serenia, I give serenia with the chemo. I'll do serenia for a week after. I send them home with ritazapine. And now I'm also sending them home with Entice. And a lot of my cases, especially if they, you know, are very sensitive to an appetence issues, the owners, I will have them do Serenia and Entice for the week after. And I have not seen the profound anorexia that some of my colleagues, so I don't know if I've been lucky or if it's because I'm so proactive. And you guys know that if you've come to my talks. I want us to be very proactive and not reactive when it comes to chemotherapy, just in case medications, as I call, um, you know, and in appetence especially, because it's way easier to pre uh, to prevent these side effects than to treat them once they happen. So let me just see. Uh, it was T-cell, went to Doxo next, then Lomustine, owner had scheduling difficulty, dog wasn't behaved. Yeah, so if it was T-cell, um, I probably would have gone to Lomustine yet. 
Next, um, assuming it had no liver issues and its ALT was okay, another thing that I like to do is put them on Denimarin preventatively with or low mustine. Um, but yeah, so if it was T-cell, I, I, I usually go preferentially to low mustine and then I would have done doxorubicin. But you will see B and T that respond to both of low mustine and doxo. Um, but yeah, and if the dog wasn't well behaved, low mustine would probably be easier than doxorubicin as well. Um, average survival on single agent Tenovia. Hmm, great question, Beth. Um, I don't remember offhand. Um, and I can't even blame it on being tired. I just don't remember. I remember that the response rate was in the 70s, um, but I will look it up because it's probably in my lecture and or in my lecture notes, and I will pop it in the comments uh, later tonight or by tomorrow before I get on the plane to go to VBMA. Uh, Lisa, who's an oncology technician down in Florida and will be hanging out at VMX and also has Labradors, which I love. Um, haven't used Tenovia. Looking forward to hearing more about it at the conference. Yeah, we'll be using the future. Um, it's a good jug. I mean, I really, really like it. I'm really excited about the opportunities. Um, you know, there's talk about will it get into the top protocol, like I said, will we pull another drug out? Because as you know, we've really hit a wall with lymphoma, um, which has been the frustrating part is, you know, we get them out to the you know median survival time about 13, 14 months, um, but we haven't really had any significant improvements in the median survival time. We were all really excited about the monoclonal antibodies from Aritana, Blantress, and Tactress. Um, but, you know, they didn't do for human lymphoma what rituximab did. And so that has been a really super frustrating part of the monoclonal antibodies. And again, that's where I give props to VETDC for really doing great clinical studies to show the efficacy um, with that. So um, that has been really exciting. So we've put in the comments the links to um, Tenovia, to their website. Um, like I said, if you're at any of the conferences, uh, is anyone going to VMX, NAVC? Um, Emily, I just saw your question. I will look at it in a sec. So I'll be at VMX. I will be at AVMA. I will be, I don't know where I'll be. I'll be at Uncharted, Andy Works Conference. I will be at Western. Um, so I'm super excited. I have a kind of a crazy schedule. I'll be in Indiana. I'll be at Midwest in Ohio. Um, so I will be on lots and lots of planes at lots and lots of conferences. So I'm going to try to uh, Kim, you're going to Indiana. Yay! So um, let's try to, I want to do some meetups and stuff like that um, and get together and hopefully you guys can come to my talks and I, we can meet each other in person because that would be super exciting. So yes, we will wrap it up. Um, so Brianna wants to know, can you talk about Entice? And then let me do Emily's question first because it ties into what we were talking about. If the ALT is okay, um, do low mustine. How do you proceed if the ALT becomes elevated? So usually, um, you know, ALT, um, sorry, low mustine can be hepatotoxic. Um, in some of the original studies, it can be fatal and irreversible. The one dog that I put into liver failure from low mustine did recover after a couple of days in the hospital, never gave low mustine again, um, but usually it is irreversible and fatal. So you really want to watch those liver values when you're when you're before you give it and as you're going through therapy, um, usually you'll see people say two times the um, two times the upper end of normal. So usually about 250 is my cutoff. Um, if they are due for low mustine and their ALT is six seven hundred, I will not give it, and I will alternate it with something else. So maybe I can give Elspar that visit. Maybe I can tell the owners we're going to give Vin, Vin Christine this week, and then give your dog an extra week or two, and then we can try to um, you know see if the liver values improve. I have had some dogs that is you know they can't handle low mustine every three weeks, but if I alternate it with another drug, they can get their low mustine every five weeks with another drug in between. Um, I have had some dogs that get 12 doses of lumustine and their ALT never changes. And I've seen some dogs where their ALT will increase, you know, after the first or second dose. So we don't really have a good understanding why that happens. But Denimarin has been shown to be helpful. There is another study that said it wasn't as helpful as the first study said. That always seems to happen. But I still will put them on Denimarin um, if they can't afford Denimarin. Um, use Denosil. Um, PetRx has a liquid version. A lot of my cat owners have a hard time pilling. That would be another option as well. So again, if your liver values are elevated, um, I would delay the chemotherapy um, and try to give them something else. If you feel like you know a week or two would be detrimental to their lymphoma or their mast cell tumor or their brain cancer or what else you're using the low mustine for. 
Um, I was going to say something else about that. So the other question is if it's like close, right? So, you know, if it's like 275 or 325 and nothing else is working, um, I will go in the room and talk to the owner and tell them the pros or the cons and make sure that you go through it with them and, you know, because I have given, you know, ones that have been 280 because I just felt like the dog really needed it and the owners understood the risk and I documented the crap out of it, right? Um, because we really want to make sure that it's in the record that the owners made it an informed decision, you know, even though the liver values were at the higher end or slightly above normal. So hopefully, Emily, that will be um, answer that question. Um, Bruce will be at Uncharted and Lisa and I are going to be hanging out at um, VMX. You're welcome to join us and we'll be at the Rob Thomas concert because if you guys follow me at all you know I'm a huge Rob Thomas fan and he is the musical guest at VMX and I'm super excited um okay focus um okay so can talk about the experiences with Entice have you gone off labeling cats so great question Emily I have been so waiting for this drug to come out um, a couple of years ago, my own cat had IBD, which transformed and became lymphoma, and the cat did not eat consistently and um, gave me a whole new appreciation for the challenges of being a pet owner and trying to force feed your cat, trying to open up 82,000 different cans and, you know, turkey and tuna and everything like that. So inappetence is real, and inappetence is a really important measure of quality of life for us as pet owners and for our clients with their pets. So you guys know that, but again, I think it's worth repeating. So um, Entice never got on the market for Jeter, sadly, um, but I'm very excited. Um, and we have started using it in cats. The dose is two megs per kg. It's an off-label dose. Um, some of the comments from some of my colleagues who um, were using Entice and associated with the development of it did say that some cats will salivate more, and that is one of the rare side effects in dogs. I think three to five percent of dogs will salivate from it as well. Um, I have really been impressed with Entice. I'll be honest. So yesterday I was just talking to Pokey, not Pokey, that's my patient, but the owner. And so Pokey is a white pity that just recently relapsed for lymphoma, and so she's going through CHOP a second time. And Serenia never really did it for her after Dr. Rubison, um, and he said like that Entice, I give it to her, and she eats like a hound. Um, Pokey could use. You know, po Pokey's not, you know, cachexic or anything like that. But um, again, so I have been very impressed with Entice. It's once a day. Um, it is really cool. And this is where I geek out a little. It's a ghrelin agonist. So it mimics the hunger hormone and it confuses the, um, the brain, the hypothalamus into thinking that it's hungry. So it's a really unique mechanism of action. So, you know, different than Serenia, different than Mirtazapine, um, Zofran and Anzimet and things like that. So it, we can use it together. And one of my new talks this year that I've just finished putting together is all about these different medications and how we can use them and their different um, uses and the different mechanisms and how we can use them together. Because um, one of the things that I just sort of have appreciated over the years is um, inappetence is really hard for owners to identify um, and they struggle to identify it and use the medications and it's a huge quality of life and again thinking about trying to get Jeter to eat was really really hard and stressful and put me in tears so um, that's sort of the synopsis on it one of the hard parts is it is a little bit expensive because it's a new drug what I will usually do so like a big dog will get like three and a half mLs and the small bottle is 10 mLs. So that's like, you know, barely three doses. Um, and then there's a slightly bigger bottle. So a lot of the times I still will start with a small bottle, make sure it works for the dog before they invest in the bigger bottle because it's not inexpensive. Um, Lisa is dispensing entice. So she, again, she's an oncology nurse down in the Florida region and loving it. So yeah, I've been really, really pleased with it. Um, again, usually I have the owner start with a smaller bottle and then... Um, we can work up to a bigger bottle. Um, Emily, no, it wasn't Emily. That was Brianna's question. Did that answer your question? In cats, I have a little less experience um, in terms of their response. One of the kitties I was using, it had lingual squamous cell carcinoma. It was funny. She was drooling crazy to begin with. And mom was like, well, I'm not going to be able to tell if she's drooling. But, um, you know, that was a hard cat that just to get to eat so because of the pain and so we had on buprenex and everything else like that but so far I've been pretty pleased and like I said it's a new mechanism of action some really good studies pretty safe and things like that um, I think you want to be careful with um, kidney disease and stuff like that so um, I've been pretty excited about that so hey yay Emily B at Western so yeah I'm a little 
crazy travel girl uh, coming up and I'm super excited. So is anybody else going to VBMA? So the Veterinary Business Medical Association. It's my first meeting. I'm super excited. Um, yay, Brianna. Um, hopefully we'll see you guys there. If you guys have any other questions, I will stay on for a few minutes. I'm so happy. Sorry we had some technical glitches in the beginning. I'm super excited that you guys have joined me and that you are finding this helpful. And we are doing this again. Caitlin, remind me, was it March 1st at 9 p.m. on Thursday? Should we make that one a happy hour? Is anyone against drinking? <laughs> I'm bringing a wine glass. Um, it will probably be in the same cup because I have spilled my coffee on my keyboard ones. So this has been probably 14 years going. I'm only allowed to have closed containers near electronics, um, which is a rule that I abide to um, because I now have a MacBook and I'm afraid to ruin it. So um, <laughs> yay, Caitlin will be there. So guys, I'm super excited. I hope that you found this helpful. Um, thanks, Jim. I will, Jim, you're going to Uncharted. So if you guys don't know about Uncharted, it's a really unique um, conference of Andy Rourke's. Um, there's um, two conferences. I'll be at the um, April one. So will Caitlin. I bet you Bruce will be there. Uh, it's a really awesome tribe. It's a really cool core group of motivated inspiring veterinarians who support each other. We answer a lot of other questions. It's a really great community. So if you feel like you're looking for a community, I would definitely check out the Uncharted community. Um, Caitlin, can we throw a link to that as well? Because the conference is going to be pretty cool. So thanks, guys. That was totally fun. I barely drank my tea or my wine. Is any before we go? Is anyone else will anyone else drink wine with me? Because if I'm drinking alone, it's going to be really really lame. So we might do cocktail hours at the next one, um, and it could be non-alcoholic if that's your if that's your pleasure. All right, Bruce, you're drinking with me. Um, thanks, guys. Um, hopefully everybody had a great time and this was useful. And we will see you guys back March first, and hopefully I will run into you guys at some conferences. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Have a great one.